But I, I want to thank the organizers also for this wonderful opportunity to getting us together uh, in this special place. I will tell you a story about quantum science and atomic clocks. And I will start with, you know, people have been discussing wonderful physics here. Uh, what's the quantum advantage? From a you know, fundamental physics perspective, I feel that you know, we have been doing physics mostly from three areas. We build microscopes, we build telescopes, and we, we look at things with complexity. Microscopes tends to think about as a standard model, how we, build, how we understand the universe, how the particles come to very short distance to collide with each other. Telescope allow us to look at a large scale uh, universe. And the quantum complexity is what we are discussing today. We are many body entanglement, phases of matter with quantum simulations, quantum information, quantum computers, and so on, all coming together. And I want to make one point. Uh, Chris Monroe was challenging us and I actually made some uh, uh, adjustment to the slides. He was like, let's put some more philosophical discussions into the talks. So, so this is a, what I was thinking about, you know, this quantum complexity, the quantum advantage may come from the frontiers of a measurement. By understanding quantum complexity, building quantum systems, as quantum simulation, quantum computing, will actually allow us to go build better microscope, better telescope. And actually, clock is our telescope and a microscope, I would argue. You know, if you build a better clock at 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 22 level, you can use to listen to gravitational waves. You can put this on a understanding the, what's the origin of dark matter. Maybe we build these um, clock network in the sky that allow us to look down and check relativistic geodesy on the Earth and really help us to monitor our Mother Earth environment, and so on. So the quantum clock and metrology, of course, comes together. If we look at a historical perspective, uh, the, the science has been going along to build the quantum systems with the longest possible coherence time, use lots of particles to, so you can build the quantum measurement precision. But nowadays, uh, the new frontier is coming where we can use many body states to build entanglement and, and quantum optimization for building these quantum sensors. Over the past couple of decades, uh, the, the field of quantum science, atomic physics, and so on has given us a lot of new tools, quantum control of individual particles, laser technologies, frequency combs allow us to build lasers with a pristine phase coherence, and quantum gas experiments that we heard this morning and uh, about quantum simulations, lattices, and so on, gave us many body states. And so the clock progress has been going along very, very fast. We talk about Moore's law. You can see, you know, when new technology comes in, the slope of the progress actually changes compared to the microwave clock. But I have to say, we are only scratching the surface. Just a few years ago, we are talking about making clock precision reaching few parts 10 to the 19, and it's just three years later, we're talking about mid 10 to minus 21. The talking about the accuracy of the clocks, we were looking at 10 to minus 18 a few years ago, and nowadays, uh, all the many body effects, when I put millions of atoms in the optical lattice, I can't understand those many body effects at the level of three times 10 to the minus 19. And this is still ongoing. Uh, if we start to put an entanglement, Michel Lukin said, well, a uh, quantum computer is nothing but an entangled clock. And I can put him back. I can say clock is a, is a, is a, a, a special quantum uh, computing machine that allows us to serve a particular purpose of a metrology. So, so really, the challenge is how do we use quantum physics to reach 10 to minus 19 and beyond, and use this to probe fundamental physics. So I want to, spe uh, to talk about a specific experiment you know, uh, where you put atoms in a three-dimensional optical crystal. If you scale the system with a one million atoms with a coherence time of two minutes, you should be able to build a clock with a precision of just four parts 10 to the 20 at one second. And that would mean that you should be able to listen to gravitational waves after 100 seconds of average in time. The current record is only two orders of magnitude away from it. Um, but if you think about a system like this, it goes back to the questions, discussions we had this morning. And Emmanuel and, and uh, Magic and, and so on, Bill was challenging, you know, what, what does that mean, those Hamiltonians and so on. But, you know, the question of building these systems when you have a, such a densely packed atoms, you want to put a million atoms in this very high density, the quantum gas density, you have to ask yourself the question, do you believe the measurements you are making out of these systems? Because you know the atoms are going to interact with each other. And, and so, so understanding the Hamiltonian becomes 
an absolute necessity in the experiment. Furthermore, by understanding the Hamiltonian uh, deeply, you will find a new way out of uh, uh, an optimized ways of uh, building better metrology. So from both perspective of precision and accuracy, understanding those Hamiltonians are actually going to become important. If I have time, I'll tell you a little bit along the way of trying to understand the systematics for this clock. There are a lot of new interesting physics that come out of this. There are the various different interaction regimes that are listed here will, will be briefly discussed. So if I look at the three-dimensional crystal and I'm driving with a, a very space sta uh, stable laser, and have a spin, which you can, you can encode it at excited ground states of the clock states. The, on the upper there, there's an equation, which is what we discussed this morning, Fer Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian. There's a tunneling term, there's on site interaction term, there's Rivi drive. And if you look at these kind of a, uh, three dimensional systems, somebody mentioned, and maybe it was Emmanuel, it's very easy to manipulate the, the geometry. You can turn this into a three dimensional crystal or 1D pancakes or 2D uh, array of uh, tubes and so on. And it's a really interesting looking at it in the experiment. You can actually go to these different regimes of the uh, geometry of the lattices. And there's all kinds of coherence coming out of this, this system. And it, there's no mystery behind this. It's all driven by this Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian that I was just uh, describing to you. But going in there, understanding why they give us different regimes of coherence, what kind of systematic effects may come out of this is what we do as a clock maker. So let me give you an example. For example, on the first column where it, the three-dimensional crystal turns into a, a, a stack of a pancakes uh, when you have no transverse confinement. In this particular regime, uh, we actually make the lattice extremely shallow, and I call it vanier stock lattice, uh, essentially meaning that between individual pancakes, the atomic wave function actually spreads out because the lattice is so shallow, and they, they have a gravitational potential energy difference between individual pancakes, which is nothing but mgh. H happens to be the lambda over two, the wavelengths you build in those lattice with. The, we use so-called a magical wavelength lattice, where the ground state excited state shares the same AC stock shift. Um, and what's really interesting I showed in the, in the picture here is that atoms in a single pancake can interact with each other. They are identical fermions, so they interact with each other as a P wave. But between neighboring pancakes, because atomic wave function is spreading out, and because of a laser phase is different between these individual pancakes, these fermions are not identical between neighboring sites, and they can interact through S wave. They can fine adjust S wave, P wave interaction such that interaction effects can be tuned away for clock. Uh, another really interesting aspect is the coherence time of such optical lattice can be exceedingly long. In this particular experiment, we can actually achieve quantum coherence almost one minute long with 10 to the five atoms. So you can imagine if you can utilize the entire quantum resources here, the clock uh, precision is going to be even better than what we were able to demonstrate today. And another really interesting aspect is because the wave function is spread out among different pancakes, you can drive it on, on site, but you can also drive off site. Now the data is shown on the right hand side, you can see there's multiple lines. These are the central line, black line is the one that is drive on site, but they are almost like sideband looking uh, features, which are nothing but you're driving off site transitions. <coughs> Excuse me. Essentially, you're building an a, a, a interferometer that involves both internal degrees of freedom spin. That's your clock, but also external degrees of freedom because they're evolving at different heights, and that's atom interferometer. So you can, in one system, you can measure g, the local gravity, as well as gravitational potential simultaneously. And in, indeed, we were able to use systems like this to achieve clock measurement precision that approaching. Uh, mid 10 to the minus 21. And you can use this to test, for example, Einstein's gravitational time dilation uh, over when you move the clock by 100 microns by comparing the top half versus the bottom half, the distance between those are a few hundred microns. Uh, Einstein's general relativity predicts 10 to the minus 20. And I think we can keep going. Uh, in the next few years, we may be able to resolve gravi gravitational redshift on a length scale of approaching the quantum mechanical wave function, just a few micron. And imagine under this regime that you study quantum many-body physics and entanglement across that kind of a distance. 
how do we go there? Well, one area that uh, Eugene Polzik and among others have been talking about is the quantum noise. And traditionally, Clock is just using very coherent laser to probe these atomic coherent superposition, which has so-called quantum projection noise. And that's why you use lots of atoms. It's a one way to scale up the quantum precision, the precision of the clocks to use lots of atoms. The other way is to use entanglement, the spin squeezing, and so on, uh, so that you can hide away the individual noise, but rather being represented by a single atom's noise, which is so-called Heisenberg limit. And if you want to do that, we can learn from some of the pioneers in this audience and, and, and so on, uh, looking at spin squeezing. Uh, in, in this particular case, we were interested in doing spin squeezing in a state-of-the-art optical lattice clock. And you can see there, uh, we have this optical lattice can be moved up and down. These atoms, sample A, sample B, can be moved in and out of this cavity, which act as a cavity QED probe, the so-called quantum non demolition probe, that you can actually use this to kind of a spy on the superposition that you have between the ground state and the excited state of the clock superposition. And if you can do that without destroying the coherence, then you can improve on the, on the uh, measurement uh, precision going below the so-called quantum projection noise limit. And this, this is a, something that's initial steps we were showing that at 10 to minus 17 level of clock precision, spin squeezing start to make a difference. And our hope is certainly pushing the entanglement frontier all the way out to 10 to minus 20 to really show the entanglement is the one that allow us to uh, go for the uh, further uh, measurement frontiers in the future. In the remaining few minutes, I will tell you, uh, go back to the three-dimensional optical lattice. Remember I to told you that one way to really understand, uh, to push the uh, measurement frontier forward is to use, just to use lots of atoms. And I want to give you four uh, specific problems very quickly in the next few minutes, you know, t t telling you about, uh, in order to really certify the clock is accurate, you really have to understand a lot of those systematics, and that's why quantum simulation will play an important role for us to understand what's going on in systems like this. So the first one is the nuclear spin impurity. Uh, the reason why this is important, and this is just showing you the imaging of the uh, degenerate Fermi gas gets filled into this three-dimensional optical lattice, and indeed you can, you can have one atom per site filling. And it's, so suppose you have a one atom per site filling, but strontium atoms actually has 10 different nuclear spin states. Uh, and when you have a 10, suppose you have uh, impurity, but if you have a, a nuclear spin that's not uh, in the majority of the, the atoms are in a single nuclear spin state, but if you have some spectator atoms at a different nuclear spin state, they can actually occupy on the same site because the Pauli exclusion principle does not apply to non-identical fermions. In that case, uh, as soon as you have two atoms occupying the same site, the interaction energy is so strong that they are moved away from the central carrier, and the central carrier is where we build the clocks. And in fact, you can uh, use not only just two atoms on top of each other, but you can have three atoms, four atoms, five atoms on top of each other, and they are always well separated from the carrier. And you only see, always see two peaks. One is symmetric, one is anti-symmetric, and t tells you the so-called SU in symmetry because the nuclear spins do not interact with the uh, electronic spin in this particular case because electronic spin J equals to zero. So that's nice. The, the nuclear spin impurity is no longer a problem for your clock operation. Now suppose now I finally have all the nuclear spins are purified. So I have a single nuclear spin state. Now I'm driving my clock but because the wavelength of the laser that's driving the clock transition is not, a com is not a commensurate with the spacing of the lattice, the, the clock laser can, can create a sort of a spiral phase as it propagates through the lattice. <coughs> and in this case, even with a single nuclear spin, you can create uh, atoms that some of them are in the ground state, some of them are in the excited state due to this spin orbital coupling mechanism. And it's showing here in the bottom where the, the laser phase is propagating, there's an e to the i kr term. And if the kr is not exactly integer multiples of two pi, these different layers of atoms experience this different phase shift of the, of the laser. And that gives rise to uh, this, this effect of so-called spin super exchange, where I justify the second order perturbation of the tunneling, uh, the, the atoms from neighboring sites, one is in excited state atom, the other one is the ground state atom, you can go through the interaction as scales as a tunneling rate squared divided by the on-site interaction U. 
And this rate is very small. This interaction energy is very small on the order of a hertz or so. And if you look at a Ramsey fringe of the clock, and you can actually see these uh, super exchange interactions directly manifested in a coherent fashion on your Ramsey fringe with, uh, and is shown on the, on the data figure. So this is another important systematic effect that we need to understand. Um, the third one, uh, you, can, you can remove this uh, super exchange interaction effect once you understood it. Now that you have these atoms individually prepared, they are being driven into a coherent superposition. You can think of them as individual radiative dipoles. And these individual dipoles, of course, can have the so-called retarded potential interacting with each other, e to the kr over kr. And since you have hundreds of thousands of these atoms working together, even though the individual transition dipole moment is very tiny, and uh, on the order of one micro Debye, compared to what we just heard about Rydberg physics, which is a thousand Debye, this is a many, many orders of magnitude smaller. Talking about speed, this is extremely slow physics here. Uh, but I'm not here to make money, so that's OK. Uh, as, as, and, uh, but it was a, you know, with these many atoms there, you, you start to worry about so-called a cooperative lamp shift. Uh, that happens to be at the level of 10 to minus 19 scale, and it's the many excitation limit. So you can't really use classical computers to solve these uh, many atom interactions, entanglement, and so on with these dipolar interactions. But experimentally, we can, of course, measure that using two different internal states, whether it's dipole moment uh, with a strength of 9 over 11 or 2 over 11. You can see clearly, depending on the tipping angle of the dipole, the, the, frequency, the clock frequency shifts. And unfortunately, we can measure these effects at a 1 times 10 to minus 19 level. So again, we can tune this dipolar interaction away if I want to show, you know, to bill, this is an accurate clock. I have to be able to say, here's the dipolar interaction, but I can tune this to 0 when I wanted to. Finally, I want to end on this final slide. It's really interesting to look at Van der Waals interaction, which we, of course, all understand from coming from cold atom physics. We use Van der Waals interaction to understand scattering length and so on. And it typically, people describe uh, two atoms separated from each other. When you drive actual dipole, real dipoles, there's a dipole-dipole interaction, which I just talked about in the previous slide. But even if you, in the Van der Waals interaction, if you have two atoms separated from each other, and you do not drive these into these real dipolar transitions, but you're just sitting in the ground state, the vacuum fluctuation will give rise to this Van der Waals interaction that scales with 1 over R6. And in fact, if you pull the atoms away from each other longer than the radiative um, wavelength, th there is actually 1 over R7 effect coming from, which is what we typically call um, Cashmere interaction. And this really comes from the vacuum fluctuations mediating two dipoles virtually being ex exciting each other. We can now measure those effects also in the clocks. But typically, the scale of these interactions is very tiny. Again, at the 10 to minus 19 level, just imagine two atoms never touch each other. They are se separated from each other by half a micron or so. And the inter Van der Waals interaction is on the scale of 10 to minus 19. You can pull them apart build by building a Cordian lattice, and you can measure exactly the length distance uh, uh, for, as a function for the so-called uh, Cashmere force. So, so I want to end on this. Uh, slide to tell you, you know, I just mentioned the four very quickly, four systematic effects to, to be able to say this clock is accurate with all these many body effects. But of course, there are other effects I haven't talked about. Uh, and only by understanding these kind of a complex Hamiltonians, connecting with quantum simulations, connecting with the theory, experimental collaboration, and so on, will allow us to build, con continue to build, advance the frontiers of a measurement accuracy, as well as uh, finding new ways to push the frontiers of our measurement precision. And I want to thank many of those graduate students and postdocs who have contributed to this. And particularly my collaborators at HLA, James Thompson, Adam Kaufman, and of course, Anna Maria Ray being a long-term collaborator from the theory side. Thank you.